Good evening and welcome to the Communication Roundtable. Today our roundtable will focus on changing business models in the media. Now I will briefly introduce our distingu distinguished panel of experts, uh, Mr. Andrew Natchison. Uh, he's a writer, journalist, explorer, um, analyst, social entrepreneur, networker, advisor, speaker, conference organizer, and creative consultant. He's co-founder and a managing director of V Media, a digital agency and consulting group. He is also co-founder and CEO of iFocus, a not-for-profit not research center and futures lab. And he's co-founder of vSpace, a collaborative workspace for tech startups and digital creatives in Reston, Virginia. Mr. Natchison helps commercial and non-profit organizations worldwide deal with complex change, digital transformation, and communication in an info-saturated world. His work through conferences such as We Media New York City on April 6 connects, informs, and inspires leaders from all sectors to improve the human experience in the digital world. Mr. Natchison learned from remarkable teachers the art of fiction from novelist Frank McCourt, uh, computer programming from basic creator John Kemeny, and social activism from Pacific Island nuclear testing witness and author David Bradley. He has reported and edited for the Associated Press, written for the New York Times, Infoworld, Audubon, and other magazines. <coughs> He's managed one of the world's most ambitious small market newspaper web websites, Lawrence.com, played ca clarinet at Tanglewood and Carnegie Hall, studied wildlife development and environmental po policy in Kenya, spoken on media convergence and business strategies in Asia, Europe, Australia, and Latin America, and currently serves on the board of the World Editors Forum. He has published two short fiction stories, written many others, and swears there's more to come. He earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy at Dartmouth College and lives with his wife and two sons in Reston, Virginia. Wow. <laughs> That's all one sentence. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> the wrong um, then we have uh, Mr. Andrew Sherry. Andrew Sherry is a senior vice president for online communications at the Center for American Progress, a 240-person policy research and communications organization headed by John Podesta who was President Clinton's chief of staff and head of President Obama's transition. A former journalist, Mr. Sherry was based in Hong Kong, Hanoi, Nicosia, and Paris, first as a wire service reporter, then as a magazine editor. He jumped, to, jumped into the technology business in 1999, helping launch a company that deployed broadband internet and web portals to hotels in nine countries. Returning to the US, he became director of online ventures for USA Today, working on innovations in both online travel and news. He joined CAP in 2005 when it was just a year old. CAP and its sister organization, the CAP Action Fund, pub publish AmericanProgress.org, the blog ThinkProgress.org, and other sites serving more than a million monthly unique visitors. Then we have Mr. Charlie Michel. Mr. Mitchell is the former editor of Roll Call, the newspaper of Capitol Hill. Mitchell, uh, Mr. Mitchell oversaw an editorial staff of 30 plus editors, writers, photographers, and production people. He was instrumental in the publication's transition to 24 by 7 news coverage through rollcall.com. Prior to that, Mr. Mitchell was senior editor of National Journal's Congress Daily covering congressional policy and politics. He oversaw the publication's coverage of congressional leadership, politics, and lobbying. He co-authored National General's Journal's uh, Week on the Hill feature and wrote extensively about campaign finance reform and other issues for the magazine. He founded and co-authored the publication's Outside Influences lobbying column. He has extensive contacts in the lobbying world as well as on Capitol Hill. Prior to joining National Journal Group, he spent eight years as a reporter, editor, and publisher for Inside Washington Publishers, one of Washington's premier training grounds for reporters. In late 1994, he founded and developed Inside the New Congress, Inside Washington Publish Publishers um, weekly report on the inner workings of then new Republican congressional majority. 
Currently, Mr. Mitchell is serving as an editorial consultant at Inside Washington and helped the company launch a new online publication, Clean Energy Report. <laughs> then we have Mr. Peter Terukuri. He is regarded as a thought leader in the po political information industry. Uh, Mr. Cherukuri is currently the Vice President and General Manager for the DC Bureau of Huffington Post, overseeing operations and revenue as the innovative news outlet expands in the Washington market. Prior to Huffington Post, Mr. Peter uh, Cherukuri was the publisher of Roll Call, overseeing the business ed and editorial operations for the Capitol Hill newspaper and helping the company diversify via acquisitions into a multi-platform information and advocacy services company. Additionally, he has led marketing and business development efforts for TMG Custom Content, a DC-based agency that develops targeted print and online content for corporations and nonprofits. He received his start in the political publishing market, working at National Journal Group and Congressional Qu Quarterly in product development and branding leadership roles. Originally, originally from Mingo County, West Virginia, he received his BA from Colgate University and currently serves on the board for the National Press Foundation and the West Virginia University School of Journalism. So um, now I would request Mr. Natchison to um, and, uh, uh, speak a few words. Um, for five to seven minutes. Okay, uh. okay. or are we done? Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the topic, and let's see. I, you got sound? You're good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We'll so, so the round table or straight table is is on uh, business models, um, and the uh, and my first thought was to pass and take the next question, um, but but I but I I did scribble down a few notes um, from the kind of the big the big forces that I see um, uh, right now and and um, the story has changed I've been I've been tracking digital media for a long time uh, some big pieces of the story haven't changed um, uh, you know the, the, the short simple part of the story is that uh, uh, traditional media institutions are crumbling um, uh, some faster than others, but but they're all crumbling, uh, and there isn't really a great deal um, to to add to that, other than that um, we're in a period of invention and destruction, and um, I've focused my business on the invention part of that story. Um, there's there's an incredible period of of uh, creativity and a, and a flourishing of um, new ideas and new ventures. And uh, I thought I'd uh, just kind of touch on those a little bit. There are different kinds of startups uh, that we see emerging. So to frame this around business models, there are different kinds of new businesses uh, that are cropping up. Uh, there are little ones, um, what you might call micro entrepreneurship, mom and pop entrepreneurs. Um, and, and mom and pop doesn't necessarily mean um, you know a shop serving a local community. It might be a a small business with five or ten employees serving a global market, um, and 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 we're seeing um, more and more of these, and and I think that's only just begun. Um, then, of course, there's kind of the, the the opposite of that. There's the the mega entrepreneurship. So you, you're seeing some some investors dumping huge amounts of money uh, in, into um, startups and new ventures, some of which seem to be surviving, some of which are burning through that money really quickly um, and, and flaming out. Um, uh, but those two different scales of entrepreneurship uh, lead, you, lead you down different roads uh, uh, in terms of how the businesses are operated. Uh, there's also a flourishing of social entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and when you're talking about media, um, in some ways that, that might be the, the most interesting story today. Um, there's there's a flourishing of media produced by nonprofits and NGOs, um, and uh, what seems to be uh, an endless stream of entrepreneurs who want to start new social ventures. Um, uh, um, there's there's a there's a, a flourishing of, uh, of of interest in changing the world through media. 
Um, and um, and that segues to the to the uh, kind of parallel but separate um, piece of social entrepreneurship, which is the nonprofit uh, uh, side of media. Um, if anything, the the emergence of nonprofit media might might really be the only significant development of the last five to ten years, um, as commercial media has crumbled. Um, nonprofits have emerged to try to fill some of that void. S some of them, I'd say the I'd say the the the, the jury is still out uh, on whether that's a sustainable replacement uh, for commercial media. Uh, but but again, we've seen some large scale investments in nonprofit media. We've also seen lots of smaller scale uh, nonprofit startup to try to fill the void. Um, uh, and in general, I'd say they're generally they are. Um, they're not that highly creative. Uh, they're often um, nonprofit uh, reinterpretations uh, of the old media that failed. Um, uh, the, the innovation is that uh, there aren't investors uh, involved. Um, but the most creative entrepreneurship that I see, um, frankly, is, is coming out of the technology world uh, and technology driven. Um, uh, ventures that may not even call themselves media uh, to start out with, uh, but but they turn out to function as media. Um, whether, whether that's um, something like Flipboard, which is aggregating um, uh, uh, tweet streams in innovative ways, or cho choose your platform. Um, uh, th there's um, an amazing uh, volume of, of creation. Uh, driven by technology savvy entrepreneurs. Um, and, and the last piece I wanted to touch on, especially for this, for, for this audience, um, is, is the other side of media, because really I've talked about journalistic uh, media. Uh, and, and the other area where I've seen a, a lot of innovation um, is on the um, marketing and um, uh, communication side of the business. Um, the, the social media management, uh, um, the, the brand management, and in some ways um, it looks to me like, uh, like marketers and marketing firms um, have, have taken the lead in uh, understanding and applying digital media in creative ways to, um, to drive their businesses. Um, wh whether it's through um, uh, influence and, and driving influence through, bi through buzz and social markets or monitoring for brands. Um, uh, there's a, um, an, an incredible amount of activity in the, in the PR and marketing world. Um, and, and with that, because it's supposed to be a round table, um, I think I will uh, uh, pass, it, pass it on, unless, unless you want to take questions now. No, we'll take uh, questions. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, the Center for American Progress is the story of the Center for American Progress is really the topic, the the same topic that this uh, this evening's conference is about. You know, the changing business model for communication. So, let me get the uh, business part out of the way first, and just focus on the changing model. Um, you know, the, the the business model of the Center for American Progress is it's powered by. Uh, donations and grants from foundations. So in the early days, it was powered by uh, grants largely from wealthy individuals, but as Center for American Progress gained uh, reputation for its policy work, we started att attracting a lot more grants to work on issues like education and government efficiency and energy and things like that. Now, the model is, is interesting because when, the chamber, Center, when CAP was founded in uh, late 2004, um, the founders had this notion that you, know, you couldn't just be your, your grandmother's think tank. Uh, you couldn't just like write great policy reports that would end up gathering dust in a drawer. You had to have a communications component because we were living in a communications-driven society. But at the same time, no one exactly knew what that meant or what that was going to mean. So um, CAP's core communication efforts starting up were really about being kind of the classic press shop, getting op-eds placed, you know, issuing statements and things like that. And CAP is still extremely good at it. We have you know, op-eds in papers all over the country this week. But um, 
you know, a group of, uh, of um, well, so then the next thing is like, all right, but we need to be sending out our own email newsletter. So they started one called the Progress Report, which sort of summed up the issue of the day as an attempt to sort of set the agenda, the news agenda. But by 2005, the news agenda wasn't working on a 24-hour cycle anymore. It was just going faster and faster and faster. So the guys who were putting out the progress report, they said, you know, we need, um, we need something faster than this. Let's launch a blog. And uh, they launched the blog Think Progress, which, um, you know, stood out from many of the blogs that were out there because even though it had a point of view, even though it was advocacy journalism, it was all meticulously researched and fact-based when so much of the blogosphere was just opinion. And uh, Think Progress has gone on to um, great success, and I'll come back to uh, later, um, you know, on that basis. Um, meanwhile, on the, on the web side, um, when I arrived at the Center for American Progress, the, people, the way people did the web is uh, policy people would write really long reports, and they would send it to a production assistant to be put into a PDF. And then the PDF would be circulated around 15 people who would all have opinions about what had to be changed. And uh, then this poor production assistant would just try to make all these changes on a PDF. I, I swear, he was about to jump out the window. It was, it was, you know, if I did anything good at Center for American Progress, it's saving him from leaping from the 10th floor of 1333 H Street. Um, so what, what we did is we actually put in an editorial workflow that I, you know, sort of basically a newsroom workflow um, for the editorial stuff. And I, so I created an editorial team, which is also the web team, because I really, it, it, it seems obvious now, but the people who actually are editing the content and working with the content should not just be handing it off to a typesetter to like put it up on the web. You know, you're on the web, you're, inter, you're interacting with, you're the ones who are interacting with the audience. So, you know, you should be having a, a big say in shaping how the final content looks. So our, we have an integrated editorial and web team and we created an art team to turn a lot of this stuff into visuals and things like that that would be much, much more accessible and shorter stories that would be much more accessible, you know, fact sheets, uh, healthcare 101, that type of stuff. Um, meanwhile, uh, a, a very um, strong um, email team was, was built that does very, very targeted email communications. And Center for American Progress also built up a lobbying organization. So you can see, ideally, all these things work together to, let's say, push a piece of uh, legislation or create the mood that might make a piece of legislation successful. Now, um, you know, all those things, though, a lot of them are kind of oriented around the traditional model of influence. It's like, who's influential? Who are you gonna try and reach? Well, you wanna reach Hill staff. You know, you wanna reach mainstream media reporters. You know, you wanna meet, reach people who work, you know, in the administration. Um, and you wanna re reach other professional policymakers. So we did all that stuff extremely, extremely well. Um, but, you know, with the rise of social media, what we, you know, what we've all seen is an emerging of another class of influencer. And so a big, you know, a, an interesting challenge of the past few years is identifying sort of like who is influential inside the social media space. And if you're going to put effort into reaching out and engaging on social media, who do you engage with? And that's, uh, that's what Dr. Rosenblatt here does all day. Um, he's sitting here right in the front row as a professor here, so you should sign up for his class. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you know, so those are those are the various things that have that have kind of come together, and then you know, and and an important part of all of that is then measuring the results of what's coming. So um, you know, very briefly, like how does this work in practice? Well, how many of you have heard of the Koch brothers? Okay, Wisconsin, the Union battle. All right, see, uh. think progress was absolutely instrumental in putting these guys on the map with research even before last summer's New Yorker article about them. You know, just this really strong tie between money and politics. And, um, you know, that has been, it, it, as a result, Think Progress has <coughs> stepped into a void that Andrew was talking about that the mainstream media had not been paying attention to, but the mainstream media has actually followed and made that a very, very big story. So that's just one example. And I don't know if it's a sustainable business model, but after the Coke industries really struck back at Think Progress, we just did an appeal on the blog and an email, and we raised $50,000 in less than a week to continue the fight. Um, so, you know, and another... Um, you know, another example is uh, the Enough Project, which is part of CAP, which focuses on Africa and, uh, uh, you know, eliminating genocide. And, and there's a big focus on conflict minerals in the Congo. Um, I won't go into the details, but by combining policy knowledge, a social media campaign, lobbying, um, we we're actually instrumental in getting wording into the financial reform bill that requires companies to disclose where they get 
thing, the, the, the stuff that's in your cell phone. And that's a, you know, a big first step toward, uh, I mean, if you've seen the movie Blood Diamond, you know, that's exactly what's going on in the Congo now with all these uh, you know, rare minerals that uh, end up in your phones. All right. Um, Peter and I started at Roll Call within a couple of months of one another. And at the time, RollCall.com was essentially a very flat, static website that um, had the stories from the paper. And if we posted a story a day or a story a week or whatever, it, it was almost an afterthought. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, we had, a, we had a little departure from that in the, the summer of 2007 when Larry Craig had his problem in the, the restroom of the Minneapolis airport. Uh, we posted that story and our, our server promptly crashed right after and we, we scrambled. Peter could talk a little bit about that, but we scrambled to get it back and we learned some lessons from that. Uh, but. I used to, to always say, and I'll still say it for crying out loud, that, that Roll Call could be the, the last newspaper left in America. And it, it has these very unique attributes when you talk about a business plan, that it, it has a contained, self-identified audience on Capitol Hill. And it's, it's from the members of Congress, their staff, everybody who works there. And these folks are, are really vitally concerned with this news about themselves. And we treat them seriously and, and um, follow their issues very seriously about everything from the, the policy debates to life on the Hill to, you know, where the jobs are and all of that. And that's, that's what we used to do. Um, and, and it was a very nice model. And then sort of the internet happened to us a lot later than it happened to, to other people. And actually, Peter and I used the 2008 conventions as really our vehicle for driving roll call into the more modern age and making it a 24-7 news site. And I think we did that very successfully, but I, maybe neither of us are even happy about it. It was a lot nicer when we were doing four papers a week and you could really think about things and, and all, um, but the world had changed. and. We made a commitment at the conventions that we were going to be on all the time. And we got buy-in from the reporters on that. And I think they thought that was going to go away in September and that we would just go back to, you know, putting out these newspapers. But the world had actually changed. And if you recall, the, the financial system collapsed that fall. And so we, we never were able to get off the hamster wheel and we were never able to look back. But that raised a lot of serious challenges for us on, on the editorial side. We realized that we had to have this very robust web presence. It was desirable from a business standpoint. It was going to drive new revenue sources, and it was going to keep us in the conversation. But we had basically been built as a newspaper, and everyone had their day jobs and were being told, now you need to do this on top of it. Um, Peter, to his credit, allowed me to add resources to the newsroom. So we were always very excited about that. Um, but you had to figure out ways to do it differently because the demand wasn't going to change to produce this near constant flow of information. And the information was out there. And in this nice little lovely community of ours, we happened to have people who really could use this TikTok. And the TikTok was very valuable to them. If, if Stinny Hoyer came out and said something, at 10.55, that was actionable intelligence for these people, and they really wanted to know about it. Um, we, we had a couple of options. You could do what some of the major papers have done, and that's to create essentially parallel newsrooms, and you have a web staff and you have a newspaper staff. We thought that that would be a big mistake, and, and from both budgeting reasons and, and from you know, from the perspective of having a really tight, unified focus to, to the editorial product that you're producing. So we didn't want to do that. We did add resources. And I realize when you're talking about business plans, that's not always an option. So you have to think beyond that um, and think of different ways to do it. We did add some resources. We tried to, to create a situation where all of the reporters had a buy-in to the success of the website and to, to our various social media tools, which we frankly were slowly, slowly, slowly getting into. But um, 
I think that had some success. If you could tell a reporter, you're working on a big story for a paper to, for the paper tomorrow, but I need you to do these hits during the day. You try to have them, you know, you're you're not sending them off on a healthcare story when they're trying to write an environment story from the morning. That you know, so that they can basically build their story through these hits. Um, and another one of our commitments, though, was that you're what you were going to read on the web and what you were going, going to read in the newspaper, it was going to be original content in both places, that we were not repackaging and repurposing our web stories. We were writing original content. That, that put a lot of pressure on folks. Um, I think we, we finally worked out a good balance. I don't know that either the reporters or editors would ever be entirely happy about it. So you, you need to look at other things, and, and this is – one of the things that, that I'm looking at, I've had a lot of conversations with Alan about this, of how, you know, you create, in a sense, the newsroom of the future that can fulfill all of these demands in terms of driving the type of stuff that, that you're covering. You want people to be engaged and give you that kind of feedback. You, you certainly want contributions. You want forums. You want, you know, you want people to get on the site and feel like they have a certain ownership share in the site as well and, and that they can contribute a lot of stuff to it and a lot of really good quality stuff and, and we as the news managers try and manage that but I think the one thing that, that we always try not to lose sight of is that the craft of journalism has to really be paramount and that you know you're you're putting these demands on reporters and editors but they need to be able to go out and they need to to practice the craft and do really solid reporting and, and you know that means going to a second source and not just getting one source and putting up something that you're going to be correcting a half an hour later I, I always have a big problem with that but um, folks are also empowered with all of these tools the reporters are empowered with all of these social media tools to find out where things are cooking where the interest is brewing and all and i think that it's incumbent upon us to take more advantage of that and i think that provides a real opening for us to deliver impact journalism within a budget that maybe isn't politico's budget we all don't have politico's budget but uh, i think that, that we've developed a number of models and we'll continue to do this and and a lot of this is going to be driven by the feedback that we get from people who are not just passive users of news, but people who really want to drive the story, who want to drive the coverage, and want to be involved. And with that... Hi, everybody. Uh, is this okay? All right. All right. Uh, before I start, and I, I'm just so, uh, I want to thank uh, Priyanka for having me on this panel, and, and I love to I love everything that everyone just said here, and especially to uh, Sarah America Progress, which has been the source of some of our superstars at, in, at Huffington Post, uh, and, and launched the, the careers of uh, some of the, the, the most influential and up-and-coming uh, reporters in, in our country today, and that's, that's because they came from CAP. So thank you for Nico and the rest of the the folks. Um, so uh, the the way that I want to talk about this, actually, before I start, I'd like to know a little bit more about the audience. So everyone's in this, uh, besides the professors, are in the program. Is that correct? No? Okay. So how many in the program? Okay. And so the rest of you. So how many are work work a newsroom right now? Is there one? All right. I got two in the newsroom. How many want to work in a newsroom as a journalist? Okay. How many want to work in earned media? as a PR person or something like that. Is that, is that all right? How many want to work as a, as a salesperson or, or, or a publisher in a media company? Anyone? There's one. Nice. Um, okay, that's good. That gives me a, a sense of what we, we've got here. Um, I'm sorry for the newsrooms. Um, so the way I want to talk about this is a couple, I actually had AV. I was a member of the AV club and I brought a deck, but we can't show it, so I'm going to try to do some stuff uh, on the board for you. But the first thing I want to say is that whenever I uh, look at business models, and so um, out of the, the four of us, you know, and I think a few of us have had experience writing uh, business plans and things like that, but in the media world, um, I think it comes down to three things that we should all look at. Um, how content is generated is one. How content is distributed, and then how content's monetized, right? So this is a pretty basic formula. And, but there are major shifts that are going on in each of those categories that I just want to talk about um, very briefly. 
Charlie talked about the first one a bit, how content's generated. So uh, my background and what I, what I know well is kind of the political publishing environment. And the polit political publishing environment is one that has um, an emphasis on original content. With original content comes costs. So there's been a trend um, in the last few years of like, how do we do with the rising cost to produce original content? Um, one of those uh, rays is to offset those costs through the two avenues of revenue that most media companies have, right? So one is circulation, subscription revenue, and two is advertising. In the political publishing environment, if I go to the board, is it okay if I go to the board? All right. I want to um, sketch out something if everyone's... Can you, yeah, I, I, I am going to talk to the board. Okay. All right. So, I, again, we're looking at how content is generated, distributed, and monetized. And I want to give a sketch of kind of what I look at the political information market. So, let me just, hopefully my handwriting is okay. Give me one second. Okay, so in the political information market, this is just my model, but uh, I say there's three types of political information. There's activism, consumer, and trade. So activism, what's the information you know about politics to sort of change the world, to take action? Maybe that's the type of information you might get something from a cap, for example, right? So I, I want to take action, I want to join a cause. What's the information you know about the political landscape? That kind of falls into activism. The center, consumer. What's the information I need to know about politics? Because I'm a fan of politics. I just enjoy it. I enjoy the horse races. I enjoy what's happening with Sarah Palin. I enjoy what's happening Larry Craig in bathroom stalls. Um, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. Um, and the last one is trade. What's the information I need to know about politics to do my job? Okay? So let's say five years ago, I won't do all the logos here or anything, but in five years ago, there was a group of blogs that were set up um, around the same time. I think progress was up there, but I'll, I'll stick with media sites. Um, yeah, Fire Dog Lake, Talking Points Memo, uh, Daily Coast, and uh, HuffPost. And they all started around the same time, uh, plus or minus a couple of years, with the idea of, you know, how do we take our, our concern through progressive lenses in an ideologue sort of fashion and through opinions and through like in a blog community and get our voices heard? Right? So that's kind of the core mission to all of those sites, including HuffPost. Now, HuffPost had a, a different type of take on it. It was not just about the progressive community, but Ariana saw a sort of kind of sweet spot in terms of how um, the, the world of celebrities, influencers, and political activists could all live together. Right? And then that was all out of, the, of a concern for a site over in this sector, which was uh, Drudge. So Drudge was the first sort of kind of aggregator and distributor of information through kind of conservative lenses, right? So at a response, and there's a lot of articles written about this, at a response to Drudge, HuffPost kind of was born. Okay. Um, and then what you have here, I won't put here, but the kind of center, which we still have today in the consumer world, is a lot of commoditized content, right? So you've got, you have all the networks, the newspapers, cover Capitol Hill and have Washington bureaus here, but they all sound and look the same, right? And that sounding and looking the same, in the last five years, we've seen an impact. What's happened? You've had bureaus shutting down, right? So that's the idea of saying that I'm the DC bureau for the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. I'm the DC bureau from you know, the Lexington Herald Leader. But all that content started looking like an AP story. So there was a very difficult opportunity for kind of the consumer political information market to actually be monetized on its own. So you still have that today with networks and, and, and so forth. Five years ago, you didn't see a polarization yet, but we have it today between MSNBC and Fox. Um, and then kind of in this sector, what we find we have over here, Nation, American Prospect, maybe a little bit more here, got New Republic. Uh, on this side, we'll have um, uh, Weekly Standard and the National Review. And these publications are still today um, around. Okay, they're around. They're primarily print publications where their identity is focused in a sort of um, between this idea of liberal and conservative 
um, ideologies. Then we have this sector right here, which is kind of what I've grown up in, which is the trade. The trades right now, let's say five years ago, the most important publications around at that time was you have Roll Call, The Hill, National Journal, CQ. Okay. And, and Hotline was very significant five years ago. Everyone know the Hotline? Is Hotline interesting? Hotline's one of those interesting things where five years ago, the, the must-read publication for anyone who's kind of bridging between the political and policy worlds and the kind of the, the horse, ra horse race world as well as kind of the, the influencer community was the Hotline. Today, the brand um, is kind of searching for identity because the way they, they did their content has been replaced by RSS feeds, by aggregation and uh, whatnot. So in the last five years, what's happened? Well, one thing, these publications have kind of expanded, and I wouldn't say, it's, it's hard to say they've moved away from the far left, but they've taken a different look. And that look is saying a couple of things. One, I'll say only for Huffington Post, is Huffington Post's perspective on things is trying to, and what Ariana has tried to do, and, and I think to a, a, a large success, is try to find those issues that are beyond left and right, without saying that we're not looking through the world through progressive lenses. So we see the world through progressive lenses. There's a big difference by having a perspective and being dogmatic about it, right? So for us, regardless if there's a D or an R at the end of the name, there are certain things that we will have a perspective about. And the great example in the media world that we can look to in this is what The Economist does. The Economist, you know, every week comes out, how many people read The Economist? How many pretend to read The Economist? No, so I'm just, <laughs> there you go, thank you, Charlie. So The Economist every week, comes out with a snarky um, publication that's rooted in free market principles, right? But it's kind of the, the gold standard by which the entire media industry sees itself. And it does that through a consistency in its principles, a consistency in that viewpoint. And I think for Huffington Post, that's where we're going to right now. We, you know, I don't know how many of you know this, but we got bought recently by AOL, which is great. Um, today is kind of day one. The deal just closed of the, uh, today, so it's very exciting. But the idea of being consistent in the way that you look at the, uh, the world through these lenses, and then through that consistency, your identity is secure. Your identity is secure as a, as in terms of a unique value proposition. So the other thing that HuffPost has done that's kind of interesting is that, uh, well, actually, let me say, the most significant media brand in the last five years that I think is, has affected the way that I see the world and the way that we approach things is Politico, right? So Politico comes in this market and through, you know, Sheer force has been able to demonstrate how you can have a successful national brand around politics while still covering the institutions that sort of the influencer audience um, has here in Washington, right? And because they've been able to do that, I think it's, it's kind of disrupted the business model that we have here, okay? And I'll, I can talk about that business model in a second, but I just want to just put Politico on the map here. For HuffPost, what we've tried to, I think, demonstrate is that we've moved away just from covering politics. So to the day, Huff, uh, HuffPost politics has about 12 to 13 percent of our traffic, right? So we've expanded in all these different areas. And that expansion is showing kind of the strength of, I think, of a media brand by showing the diversity that you can cover and then able to travel in a couple of wor worlds. So like Ariana has a brand that's called Third World America, her new book. And that can be an activist type of brand and trying to get people to take action about the elimination of the middle class. At the same time, our politics brand is much more aligned to this sort of kind of consumer audience. And then um, in the world that I'm a part of, we have a brand called HuffPost Hill, which is a newsletter brand they're trying to create down here. All right. So that's the landscape. What I, here you go. Um, outside the landscape, what I, I just want to say is that um, how, we, how do people try to monetize it? Everything kind of that's above the line out of the trade is monetized directly through advertising, right? So that advertising uh, monetization takes the form of two value propositions. One is size, all right? So everyone says, we have so much audience, we have so much you know, um, reach, and that, that audience has to be monetized by a high or, or low CPM, a CPM model. In that box that's kind of in the center, uh, the trade, it's a very unique an exciting audience because we uh, monetize it both through advertising by saying we reach so many people on Capitol Hill and that trade associations and corporate image advertisers need to advertise, but we also generate revenue through content. So there's premium um, dollars 
um, based on premium content and high prices that we're selling to um, trade associations, Capitol Hill staff to access this content. So CQ, National Journal, uh, Roll Call have a significant amount of money at stake. I should say CQ Roll Call. Uh, significant money amount at stake in terms of uh, charging these audiences. Now, what we've seen on that premium content side in this market that's kind of very exciting um, is seeing Bloomberg enter this market um, in the last few months. I don't know how many of you followed that, but Bloomberg's launched a brand called BGov that is trying to go after the subscription uh, market in terms of premium content. All right, so um, just to wrap up, I just want to say that it's, it's kind of an exciting time in the political information market because you see it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's a laboratory in terms of seeing how advertising and circulation uh, business models could thrive. Um, and that, that, that thriving is going to depend upon how much we can show a unique content proposition to deliver to this audience to help them do the job that then can be uh, leveraged either through advertising or circulation. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now uh, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. I'll come that side to give you the mic. Please raise your hand. Uh, if you have a question. No questions? No. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, all of the discussion really here has been about uh, creation and distribution. Uh, what I haven't heard a whole lot about uh, and I'm curious how it fits into this, is the question of monetizing this content. Uh, the traditional advertising uh, model used in newspapers and used in broadcasting uh, is certainly under challenge. And uh, so far as I know, the, uh, uh, the internet advertising medium has yet to generate revenues remotely approaching those are the traditional media. How do you pay for all of this? Uh, I can jump in on that. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about the, the models that I was talking through, but uh, I'll try to uh, explain that a bit more. So um, you're absolutely right that um, there is a, uh, there's not a, as much dollars in the online space that have traditionally been a print and broadcast. That's an ongoing challenge. What I want to say is that our success, so we, Huffington Post, we don't talk about our numbers publicly, but we had about 150% uh, revenue growth from 2009 to 2010. That revenue growth is, is, is partly through, um, I think, a concerted effort to, to sell our, our current inventory uh, more effectively. All right? That inventory is sold through you know, your standard units. We have you know, ad units like 300 by 250s and 720 by 90s, blah, 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 um, and sell those at a higher uh, CPM. But the real exciting thing that Huffington Post was able to, I think, um, take advantage of and that we see in the market, that's a big trend, is around social marketing. And what does social marketing mean? So what we're seeing as a, as a major trend is uh, something that I think CAP in the, um, in the think tank community is the forefront of, and a handful of brands are, where you see brands as publishers, right? So brands generating content, right? Um, having a publishing schedule, engaging their users through a, a variety of different uh, tools and techniques. The problem with brands as publishers is they don't understand distribution. And so the monetization component that HuffPost, I think, has taken advantage of, and uh, I can't think of other media companies that are in the space, is how could we partner with these brands, whether they're corporate image brands or advocacy brands, and distribute their content more effectively to a targeted audience? Okay, how could that, how do we do that? So for example, uh, let's take a, a, a case study, uh, IBM. IBM had a big campaign last year um, it continues today uh, called Smarter Ideas. And Smart Ideas is a campaign that to position IBM as a thought leader in the influencer community in a variety of different uh, seg segments. Uh, that IBM is leading the way in transportation. Uh, IBM is le leading the way in smarter cities and how cities are built. Now, traditionally, um, when a brand creates these types of campaigns, they use advertising to drive um, a reader to their site. What we figured out a way to do is create um, special um, sections on our site so that the uh, reader 
has a seamless uh, transition between the content that they're reading about HuffPost as related, let's say, on transportation infrastructure issues and something from uh, IBM, whether it's a CEO or one of their executives blogging for us under an appropriately uh, labeled sponsor-generated content. The other um, idea is that um, IBM and a bunch of brands are doing a bunch of social media activities. So what we can look at is try to create custom um, opportunities to ask our readers to start following a brand's Twitter feed or be a friend, um, a fan of their Facebook profile. So then what we can do is track that progress in terms of what we've done from an audience acquisition perspective. All right? So that's a very uh, unique model that we're looking at of saying that it's not about CPMs, it's not about just selling ad units, it's about distributing, helping brands distribute their content to engage our readers on, on a deeper level. You take that to a, from a corporate image perspective and you get that down to a, an advocacy perspective, then you see a lot of exciting things around petition signings, around um, trying to mobilize uh, individuals around certain causes. Um, you, you get a certain opportunity to um, position a very complex policy discussion around our community to help them break down um, these, these types of discussions. Thank you. Just a, a very simple way of looking at it. Um, you know, the Huffington Post, what he's saying is the Huffington Post does basically is not necessarily creating that much of its own content, but finding ways to monetize that. Now, I'm not saying that in a critical way at all. I, I actually admire what the Huffington Post did, which was go into looking realistically at how much revenue that online advertising could possibly generate and realize you can't sustain the New York Times newsroom based on that. So how can you create a media brand by doing that? And you know what's happened in the, in every industry in the media in in the in the, that the internet has basically the internet has gone from industry to industry, um, basically disintermediating people, wrecking the people who made their money out of controlling the means of distribution, and that's what your newspaper was when it came to the door. So every every new entrepreneur had to come and say, okay, well if if I can't make my money off controlling distribution, how can I add value? in this world that I'm talking about. And what I think what you were talking about there, you know, in addition to Huffington Post creating some increasingly amounts of its original content, but is also creating, uh, you know, finding different ways to create value, whether it's for, for brands or from consumers in the aggregation of content or something else. But it's definitely a much different model from say what the, you know, the traditional New York Times model. I could add a couple of um, different examples on on how content is being monetized. Um, uh, one is through services, um, uh, and the example I would give there is a company we helped found called C Click Fix, uh, which is a local um, mobile information service. Um, uh, what they do is, uh, if you're driving on the street and you hit a pothole, um, you can take a picture of it or send a uh, send a tweet um, to geotag it and alert the city, hey, there's a pothole here, you should fix it. Um, they've, they've turned this very simple idea into a, uh, a global service that is um, uh, being sold to local governments uh, as a way for local governments to do a better job of tracking uh, infrastructure needs, what they call non-emergency uh, needs. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a rapidly growing business. Uh, the second example, uh, if we're just looking for for innovation in, in monetizing content would be the, um, the content farm, demand media, uh, and AOL has its seed. Um, uh, these are, uh, th these are uh, very sophisticated, uh, search-driven businesses which, um, uh, using algorithms, track search data uh, and, and quantify and estimate the value for content they can produce based on search data. So for instance, uh, demand media may see that a certain number of people are searching for how do I fix a leaky sink? Um, and they can, using that data, literally figure out how much money they can make from that story over five years. And once you have that math, then you can figure out, well, if I spend less than that, uh, I can make a profit. Um, and, and this is the demand media model, which has been 
um, derided as uh, in the industry as what they call a content farm, uh, because the way it, the way it's profitable is by paying very little money uh, for very low quality content, which can um, marginally satisfy the uh, the search query, um, but demand media is only paid ten or fifteen bucks to have the story produced. Um, uh, yeah, but sure. um, li like it or not, um, it's a uh, it, it's an ingenious, sophisticated use of data uh, to to quantitatively define a new business model around content. Yeah, I just want to uh, jump on that for a second um, on the idea of content farms and um, to your point about kind of how we approached uh, Huffington Post in terms of original content generation. So I started off talking about um, the model of how we generate content. And one of the things I want to say that, that HuffPost has, I think, been at the forefront of is that most newsrooms um, and this again goes to the question of how we uh, monetize it, but most newsrooms have a hierarchy in terms of what they value uh, in content. And the peak of that sort of pyramid is usually the contents generated by their reporting staff, right? So you treat the reporting staff um, and the byline content differently than you do from user-generated content or from um, op-ed pieces, and, 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 and that, that makes a lot of sense. For HuffPost, it's kind of said, put away that model, right? So we have a certain amount of humility and agnostic to the source material. That agnosticism saying that whether it's our reporters generate a content, whether it's an op-ed piece from a CEO or from a trade association executive or a citizen, where it's a tweet, is that our trust that we develop with our readers is based on the decisions we make for our front page, the decisions we make in terms of distribution of that content. And so when you think about that sort of kind of um, rejection of a hierarchical um, source material, what that does is it helps you th uh, think about how to effectively aggregate maybe some content. To, so it's the, the cost to uh, acquire content and to spend on content generation is not as high. And then you trickle that down in terms of distribution. And what HuffPost has done um, dramatically is to rethink how content is um, optimized for search, for social, and directly. So one stat I'll, I'll share with you is that, so we got about 28 million, almost near 30 million unique visitors per month. The source of that traffic, is, I think, is fascinating. Most newsrooms, um, I think, you know, have probably a 75-25 split. 75% of the traffic's direct. They actually type in NewYorkTimes.com, and 25% of it may come from search or through social. For HuffPost, it's, it breaks down in thirds. A third of our traffic comes direct. A third comes through search, and a third comes from Facebook and Twitter uh, in the social media circles. What you're seeing there, and it, it completely changes how you monetize that content, is you're seeing um, a, a complete uh, different way of how people find content. It used to be, if it's an important content, you go find it, right? You go to the New York Times, you go to the Washington Post. But now we're seeing a fundamental shift where if it's important, it's going to come to me. Right? So that idea, if it's going to come to me, changes how a brand is going to try to monetize that relationship. So we take advantage of that from a, from a distribution perspective as saying that our entire content management system, which is completely proprietary, is thinking about each of those distribution channels. And then we're thinking about how to encourage the sharing of that content. And through that sharing and through that sort of kind of um, uh, holistic approach to how we hope Huffington Post content is being consumed, we're seeing increased traffic. That traffic then is able to be monetized through direct advertising, through some of, some of the so social marketing things that I just mentioned. So one of the big challenges to re monetizing content is rapid depreciation. Once you publish something, somebody can distribute it on their own to their friends very quickly, and those people don't pay for it. Um, Charlie, you mentioned uh, one of the things that the core box, Peter, that you of the Roll Call Hill, and that that you're putting out there that's of high value and people are willing to pay for is um, we want to know what Sandy Hoyer said at 10.55 because it affects what we do in the next 15 minutes. Right. Uh, so it's that immediacy of access to information that people are willing to pay for. Um, so kind of looking at this, there's my the thing I've been kind of exploring and trying to understand is you know what are the things that people are willing to pay for? Who is willing to pay for it? Because I think it's a newer, it's a different audience or an expanded audience than before. And what's the right price point? Right. Well, <laughs> if we come up with the answer to that tonight, we are we are in good shape. Um, it, 
It, it's interesting. You have you have in this community in Washington D.C. You have people who are willing to pay for that, and and we could keep this news behind the wall, mm -hmm. and and we charged for our website. It wasn't extraordinarily expensive, but you know I don't think an average person in Ohio is going to write a check for that because frankly their need to know what Stinney Hoyer said at 1055 is is probably nil, right? Um, so you can charge, and there, there is this in immediate actionable intelligence that you can charge from for, but the tension inherent in that is there's all this other stuff that folks out there would be really interested in. They'd be kind of interested in the Hoyer thing, but they're going to be interested in some of the scandals and some of this other stuff. So how do you create this mix of paid content and, and free content. Um, and I'm not sure what the answer is to that. I, I'm not sure if you're going to have a, a news service that is going to rely very heavily or want to be very heavily involved in social media and all of this. It, it's almost, you know, it's almost counterintuitive to say that you're going to put up a price wall there. Um, the way that some people are doing this, Politico comes to mind, they're creating these these policy verticals based on healthcare or energy or defense or whatever, and that's tailored specifically for people who are professionals in the business and who will pay um, thousands of dollars for that. We'll we'll see. There are a lot of there are a lot of companies, and we mentioned Bloomberg here, who have been doing verticals, so to speak, for years and years, and this is what they do, and they they cover these policy issues in these very, very deep dives into the agencies and all. Um, that isn't quite along with the Politico model, so it's going to be very interesting to see how that evolves over time. But I, I think it's a, it's a real tension, and I don't think it's been sorted out. Mm -hmm. You know, the two variables that, that I often uh, look at, and Charlie and I have spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, but that if you could hit the two variables, if you hit this right in the mark, I think you're able to charge whatever you want in Washington. Uh, the two variables being paranoia and vanity. So if you're able to create content that everyone's afraid uh, that someone else knows already and everyone wants content that's about them, you're able to charge whatever the market um, will allow you to charge. Um, and I think we see this time and time again. The tension that Charlie's mentioning I think is, is a correct one that I think is oft, often self-inflicted um, that we have in, in our trade publishing community. This is separate from my considerations in Huffington Post because we're never going to be charging anyone for content. But in the trade community, we, we have this idea that you know, there are millions and millions of people outside of Washington who are interested in our content. And uh, Charlie's had many reporters and uh, coming to him, it's like, you're keeping my stuff behind the wall. And you know, in Duluth, there's someone who needs to know how I cover a markup. And uh, the problem is that no one really cares what a markup is out there. And so we've got it some, uh, hopefully with um, nonprofit journalism companies, gro groups like ProPublica and uh, Center for Public Integrity, who's doing amazing storytelling out there. Um, CAP is doing amazing storytelling. And what that's gonna do is put pressure on the media market that we have here in Washington to up their game and to up their game in terms of storytelling engagement, which then will let us revisit what our business models might be. Um, and and then at that, that, that pressure on those business models has to be self-reflective where we have to say that it's okay to be a trade publisher. It's okay to just cover healthcare policy. It's okay to cover markups and be really, really good at that. The idea of getting our content consumed of being the next Woodward and Bernstein is not necessarily a, a, uh, an aspiration that, it, that has a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And so I think that's the sort of kind of um, tensions that we're feeling in this market currently, but it's an exciting one. Financial publishers have known for a long time that the two words that they're working with are fear and greed. So I'm glad you found two more paranoia and vanity to apply to Washington. <laughs> greed is good. <laughs> what kind of skills would you recommend or what areas should be the focus of people who are up and coming in the field? Andrew, he spends all his time thinking about this, but can I just put in like one request for something I'm really interested in and I don't know anything about and I'd love to have some, someone research is uh, 
<laughs> is, um, and this is something, again, my colleague uh, um, Alan Rosenblatt is, is, is working on, but I really do think that the use of real-time data is going to become a very, very powerful tool in political communications in the election cycles going forward. And, uh, and there are some incredibly powerful data crunching tools that are out there. They were developed largely for the hedge funds to uh, see if a stock was trending positively or negatively and to be doing that with politicians and if their message is working and it's resonating and and so to take you know what obama did in iowa with his trying to get real time uh, you know polling and to take it to another level i think that could be very very interesting in, in upcoming election cycles and it would be great to see someone who has an interest in quantitative matters as well as politics uh to dig into that and and alan don't you have an event coming up to look into some of this stuff is that a public event Lessons from Egypt, using social media to predict uprisings and the ensuing coalitions that emerge. So we've got people that were involved in the social media uprisings, aspect of the uprisings in Egypt, some reporters covering it, but also some uh, some real brainy people from Harvard and MIT that have been doing modeling of social media and who's talking to who, what the connections are, and using that to say, well, we could have seen the uprising before it happened. And now we can look at it and see which of the different actors are talking to each other in order to get some sense of how the coalitions are forming for how the government will emerge in to rule Egypt after the fact. And so looking at that kind of modeling to predict what's going to happen in other countries as a result. So it should be very interesting. Uh, it's at the Center for American Progress Action Fund on um, March 22nd at uh, 3 o'clock. And if you want to get on the email list, just uh, let me know after, after the event and I'll put you on it. Some, some of the same software that could be used for domestic politics. Yeah. Okay, well, so uh, I'll give a, a, a more generic or maybe higher level answer to the same question. Um, uh, I, I can't conceive of media today um, without thinking about technology. Uh, and I think uh, any career in media needs to have a, um, a, a pretty deep awareness of um, the technology that's out there or the potential for technology to be applied in different ways. Uh, so data analysis um, you know, is a nice example of that. There are, uh, there are companies out there, um, Bitly for one, uh, by Betaworks in New York, uh, which is a real-time uh, data company. Um, every time you, you shorten a link to, uh, to a Bitly um, uh, short code, um, the whole value to Bitly for that is in tracking real-time data and extracting insight out of it. Um, sentiment analysis uh, for consumer and political behavior. Um, and, and all of this requires heavy-duty technology developers. Uh, the, the two most common requests uh, that we get uh, from, from early-stage companies uh, is for access to developers and access to designers. Uh, so design and technology are, are, are the essence of digital media today. Um, and I would layer on top of that uh, all sorts of um, fundamental skills and values uh, which you can bring to your career, um, which will apply regardless of the technology you're using. Um, and the fourth piece of that would be flexibility uh, and a willingness to do something completely other than what you thought you were going to do. Uh, because I, I can guarantee you that's the story of your career. Well, I, I would agree with all of that. Um, and I would say technology as a subject area, if you, were, if you were going into journalism and you were looking for areas where you wanted to focus, technology would be a heck of a good choice. Um, we always joke that you'll, you'll never go broke if you cover energy and the environment and, and health care because there's always advertising that's attracted to that. So uh, those are good subject areas to build your expertise in. Um, in terms of data gathering also, there are very few people in this city and throughout the country who can really dig into financial disclosure forms and make sense of what they actually mean and, and go in and, and look at where the money is coming from, where the money is going, how public figures are hiding their money, how things, you know, the shell games that go on. 
Um, there, it, it's a very, very labor-intensive side of journalism, and there aren't a whole lot of jobs there, but, you know, the few people who do that are, are just absolutely top-notch experts, and, and there is a demand for them. I think uh, what, we're, what you're sensing from here is that we're fundamentally shifting storytelling, and one of the ways that storytelling is shifting is through data. And you know, for HuffPost, you know, last year we bought a, uh, a company, Polster, Com. I don't know how many are familiar with Polster, but the reason we bought Polster is because Mark Blumenthal, who is Mr. Polster, um, is an expert at data visualization, trying to do sort of kind of um, uh, taking into account his own analytics and horse races, as well as some of the polling that's going out in the marketplace, and then visualizing what trend we might be seeing um, beforehand. And so that idea of uh, doing journalism, doing content, storytelling a bit differently through data, I think is fascinating. It's something that we're trying to do that not only in the political space, but in, in other categories. And so, and, and, but where we're seeing this coming up from is from the nonprofit community, which I think is fascinating. So in the government and political space, I mentioned Center for Public Integrity. Of course, um, you, you can't uh, forget to mention Ellen Miller and the work that she's doing is that saying there's publicly available data and that um, you have a developer community who is dying to do things that are innovative as well as socially rewarding. And what, that, again, that's doing is kind of invisible hand or very visible hand to publishers is trying to be innovative in that space and take information that is publicly available, whether it's uh, lobbying disclosure forms or uh, campaign finance um, disclosures, and try to say, okay, what can we take the smartest um, people in, in the programming community and what are the sort of kind of um, trends and relationships and, um, and and key insights that we can glean from that aren't coming from the media industry because we're still married, for the most part, in the, in the media world of kind of long-form journalism or, or just printed word journalism. And so I think, uh, I hope this answers your question, but the idea of visualization, I think, is a fascinating one, and it's a it's a trending topic for us. And, and on a practical note, there was a, the Computer Assisted reporter, Reporting Annual Conference was about two weeks ago. Someone wrote a really good blog post with ten, 12 free data visualization and analysis tools. And so using those words, you should be able to find it on, on Google, but it was just great, some great free tools for that type of stuff. And then, you know, the journalist does have, a lot of times the people who are working on this, the people who know the technology, can't really use it to tell a story. And a journalist who kind of understands the data or understands the technology enough is often really, really vital. Uh, because, you know, the stuff that the Sunlight Foundation has come up with, in and of itself, it doesn't necessarily just tell a story when you just use those tools. But if you use those tools and put it together with your own graphic or your own story, then it really tells a story. Uh, the other the other area that I, I just mentioned, and we mentioned uh, the company a couple times, Bloomberg, but uh, under uh, Bloomberg's new uh, initiative, BGov, they've had a, a very original approach where they are pairing up a reporter with an analyst. And the idea is there is especially uh, thinking about the financial community. The financial community is light years ahead of the political and public policy, public affairs community in terms of understanding following the money, which is surprising given that so much of our newsrooms are built on following the money. But the idea of saying that how does government action or inaction, here's the basic premise, how does government action or inaction affect financial markets? And that's what BGov is bringing to the table. But in order to answer that question, it's not just a matter of covering the news cycle. It's a matter of looking at and, and looking at um, kind of the publicly available data and making sense of it. Um, and, and to your point is saying that some of, this, some of the stuff that comes out of nonprofit uh, groups is that they'll, they'll be able to give you access to the data, maybe show you how that data may be visualized, but putting that piece together in terms of uh, comparing it with a reporter story is what's going on, I think, is that's really exciting in something like BGov. I, I, I want to add something else on your career thinking. Uh, th that's not only uh, that you'll follow a career path, but you'll create a career path. Uh, and, 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 and the other uh, big force that I see um, is entrepreneurship. Um, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a blank slate. Um, the, the biggest limitation to now is the limits of your creativity. Uh, and for some people, that's going to mean being creative um, with a job. And for other people, that's going to mean creating your own job. Um, and, and that's a force beyond media. That's, um, uh, that's, that's a force uh, in the culture, um, driven and exacerbated by a, a difficult economy. Um, um, but uh, in terms of media, um, a, a, 
a rich opportunity for creative expression um, and maybe for business creation too. Um, since, since you're talking about monetization and, and the media, I'm just wondering, like, what, what are your frustrations um, when you think about you're trying to raise money, get advertisers, get support, and, and not only that, but you're also in a way trying to influence the public and inform the public. And I've been looking at American Progress and Roll Call while you've been speaking, and your, um, the lead story in American Progress is how Fox manipulated the story about the Wisconsin protests with the palm trees in the background. And I mean, we know that. We know that's not true, right? And it's just an example of one of many, 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 many examples from Fox News that we know is misinformation, it's not true, it's meant to sway the public into another way of thinking. But yet, they're the big dogs, they're getting the revenue, they're getting the advertisers, they're getting the, the support, and it's like the other side you know, it's very fragmented, a very fragmented media. We've never seen such fra audience fragmentation as we're seeing now on the internet. And so what are your frustrations in trying to deal with this and get, and get your word out and, and, and to inform the public when you have sort of this, this, this giant, you know, here on this other side? What, what are your frustrations with this? Very frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it, it is very difficult and it, it's, it, it's, it's hard to, to even say how you engage this fight because a lot of what Fox does, for example, is just so, you know, off the rails from what, what I was taught to do as a journalist and the way that you practice journalism. And yet it's, it's captured a, a big audience, a big share of the audience, and the other voices. I think you're right, as you said. They're 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 not only you know scattered, but they're they're scattered by design, and they're scattered by by philosophy. And and you know, if you there was always you know a big thing about at, at press conferences, and people are asking the president questions, and and one person ask something that just screams for a follow-up question, but the next person in, in line needs to ask about corn prices, so doggone it, they're gonna ask about corn prices, and, and actually we're taught never collaborate among each other. There's something illicit about that. Now that model may or may not have gone by the wayside, but I think that, that the social media tools that we're talking about here do provide some kind of opening. I, I don't see a, you know, I don't see a united front for truth or anything coming out, but um, I do think that the more the more that we share and the more that stuff circulates around and goes from one site to another, and then maybe that creates a certain critical mass for, you know, fact-based journalism, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm entirely optimistic about that, but I, I do think that really one of the keys, and, and I mean, I came up in print and, and was trained in the old school ways and all of that, and, and I am just absolutely fascinated with all of the opportunities that, that new media and social media tools present. And, I, you know, really the answer is going to be citizens who want to engage and citizens who want to learn and, and find the tools and what we can do and what our responsibility will be is providing them with those tools and making it usable and accessible and understandable and helping people to to sort of parse through the rhetoric and parse through the you know the ideological positions and all of that and I, I don't think that the mainstream media really addresses it or thinks about it quite in that way, but I think more and more people are starting to think about that. And I, and I hope that that's an evolution that we see over the next couple of years in this business. So, If I could push the Fox News thing a little bit harder, because it seems to me that something has been, there's, there's a narrative that's emerging that I think is kind of new in understanding it, and that is that Fox News 
actually has a news division and an entertainment division. So Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum were let out of their contracts with Fox News because they were commentators, experts who appeared on the news programs, whereas Sarah Palin and Michael Huckabee were not let out of their contracts because I'm going to guess their contracts are with the entertainment division of Fox News Network. Likewise, Hannity did not get censured or punished for donating to political candidates like Keith Olbermann did because Olbermann worked for MSNBC's news division and Hannity works for the entertainment division. So it seems to me that what they've done is a little smoke and mirrors and they've created within a news organization an entertainment division which is not beholden to any of the rules of journalism and that's how they're able to continue to perpetuate a lot of these false stories under without any repercussions But you, you, you know, there are two points that the the tendency of people to go to the show or whatever that agrees, you know, with their point of view, that's that's a relatively new phenomenon. I, I mean, you know, it, it used to be that we all watched Dan Rather or we all watched, you know, NBC News or whatever, and. and the differences between those were, were very narrow. People would say, oh, NBC, that's the Republican station. But, you know, I, I mean, it, was, it was really hard to find that difference. Um, you know, the, the other thing is that I think presenting political and policy news as entertainment and saying, you know, the reason our ratings are down, the reason that our papers aren't circulating is we're not entertaining enough, we're not hitting that button with the public, and so let's you know, let's fluff it up and do that. And, and you know, I, I understand it, it's been a problem where you have old timers in the newsroom who are pushing this, you know, eat your spinach angle and saying that it's all got to be about eating your spinach. And, and it doesn't really have to be like that. But, you know, just over the last 20 years, it's so swung the other way to, you know, gosh, can we put some bells and whistles on it and, and all of that. And away from that idea of tell a good, provocative, interesting, colorful story, you know? They, they never err on that side. That, that's always my criticism of the, the corporations who own the media, that they never err on the side of what we really need is better journalism and better told journalism. Do you think that part of it is because of the media fragmentation that we have, and that is starting with cable television? And they're trying to find these niche audiences and, and, and trying to sure. monetize their product and, and looking for the audience and trying to find what they can clue into to a specific type instead of like the old ABC, NBC that you're talking about, news media, right. which was really directed towards the mass audience when we had, you know, three channels, four channels, and they basically evenly, pretty evenly split split the audience numbers. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's obviously one of the huge factors because the need for a mass audience doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, the mass audience assembles like once a year for the Super Bowl. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone's off in their niches, and, and you know, in a niche like that, general news is one of the least valuable things you can possibly put on the internet. The only reason you can even afford any general news on the internet is because we have behavioral targeting and ads, and we can t tag somebody as a traveler, let's say, and then serve her travel ads when she's on the news section and get a, you know, and get a $15 CPM instead of a 50 cent CPM. So that is definitely a big factor. But I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, there's a lot of structural things in, you know, in American uh, society and politics that contribute to this radical polarization. And you know, you're talking about um, years and years of redistricting, where all the, both parties created safe districts. And so the only way you could beat somebody is run more to the left or more to the right of that person. That's been a big factor. Um, you know, the whole rise of the right wing. I would say misinformation machine, which started with uh, Barry Goldwater's defeat in 1964 when the Republicans said, 
oh, oh my God, these people like the New Deal. I thought they were going to just get rid of it all. They like Social Security. Um, and so, you know, they started building institutions like Heritage and, uh, you know, Cato and others that, you know, have been building now for many, many years. And, you know, CAP kind of came into that. Uh, the, the, the progressives or the, the liberals have never been as good as singing out of the same, uh, you know, hymnal. But at least now there is an institution which at least does multi-issue policy work because in the world we live in, of course, energy is linked to national security, which is linked to, you know, the environment, which is linked to that. And, you know, until actually a, a few years ago, there really wasn't a multi-issue institution on the left to sort of counterbalance the heritages and things like that. Uh, I have a question, uh, you know, like you mentioned that um, the audience, you know, we're discussing about audience fragmentation and we are saying like, uh, you know, you mentioned that one third of the traffic comes by searching Huffington Post and one third comes from social media and one third comes from search ad uh, searches. So it seems like there's no front page now. I mean, you know, there is no front page. Um, I mean, how do we know what is the news agenda? And there is this whole population of youth, which is, um, you know, um, really not talking about the front pages. Um, it's talking about a completely different news agenda. So how do we tackle, like, how does news organization, I mean, the purpose of news as a fourth estate was to, you know, bring the government and the, the information about the government. And as political, you know, news uh, casters, like, I think that's, how, how does one engage youth in this? Well, well, I'll answer in one way. Um, the others might might look at it differently. Um, but I'm very suspicious of this whole notion of setting an agenda or creating a front page for anything. Um, I think that era is largely over. Um, uh, I think individuals create their own front pages. Uh, and, and how they create them is largely through their networks. Uh, it's through their networks of, of friends, of professional contacts, uh, and of institutions that they look to uh, as among their trusted sources. Uh, but I think the notion of a, of a packaged, uh, formatted, um, front page uh, um, uh, summary of, of the day's events is, um, it, it, it's been over for, for several years now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you can look to your students, look, look, look to everybody in this room. I mean, think about how you get your information now. Um, there, there may be products and publications, but, but I'm willing to bet uh, that you're also following links um, that, are, that are collected in Facebook or Twitter, um, and you probably don't even know exactly how you found them. Um, I, I, I think the world we're living in is, is, is I, I call it a fog, an information uh, information is a fog now, and it and it just it wafts around us, uh, and and it finds us as much as we find it. Um, so uh, I'm I'm not bullish or really even all that interested in, uh, in 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 telling the people what they need to know. Um, I'll I'll just jump in here. I agree uh, in terms of the front page. The importance of front page, I don't know if it's disappearing, but it's changing what we would call a front page. What a front page does is in terms of um, helping um, share the choices we make in terms of what's priorities. The role of that um, in, in the print world has taken the form of someone like Charlie making that determination of the hierarchy of what's the, the front page story, what's the kind of the below the fold and all those sorts of decisions. Um, and, and to your point that that's, that's fundamentally changing in terms of the digital age, in terms of how people again are using these types of technologies to um, attract um, and uh, curate, aggregate, and make uh, decisions about what's important. I think in the case of, of HuffPost and, and other media brands, we're still in a stage where it's shifting. It hasn't completely gone, right? So there still is a, a, a need for trusted media sources. And that trust, though, in terms of what's the ingredients of that trust, I think is, is complicated. Um, you know, we like to think politics is an extremely important um, container of, of issues for every American, but it, it's not that case. Um, we think of it largely because we're here in Washington. Um, and so we have to have, a, a, I think, a very sophisticated, nuanced approach in terms of how we order uh, our content. So in the case of HuffPost, you know, there's no inconsistency. We actually 
strive to be um, both highbrow and lowbrow, as probably some of you know. You can see an article calling for Tim Geithner's resignation and then also see a slideshow by Lady Gaga. And, you know, that sort of um, breaking down the barriers between the kind of content that we consume between our, our left brain and right brain, the kind of content that we see that's about politics as well as what things we enjoy. I think that the more that we make that seamless, whether it's on our front page or if it's um, uh, in a tweet deck, is, is sort of kind of the aspiration for all media outlets as long as we're still making decisions of how we present that content, how we um, talk about that headline, how we sort of kind of make a decision about what's important. I think it's important for, for us to still be visible hands in, into that market. Yeah, I agree with, you know, agree also with the, the trends as described. Uh, you know, the Washington Post went to a very customized homepage in the, uh, around 2004 or so, and then they had to back off because there were still a number of people, uh, there were a large number of people who still wanted to know what the Washington Post thought was important. So, you know, my thought about the front page is if, if your audience wants a front page, you give them a front page, and when they stop wanting it, you don't give it to them anymore, just like anything else on the internet. Um, but, you know, as communicators, um, you know, Okay, so everybody's doing this, everyone's getting stuff through their networks. Okay, it's great, but if you're a communications professional and your job is reaching uh, people and getting a certain message out, you know, you have to figure out how to work in that new environment. And, and that's why I do think that the, um, you know, the analytics, not just the ones that are already available now, but the ones that are going to be coming in the future, so you can see, oh, look, you know, I have this energy idea, um, but I get it written about on a liberal blog, but the people I'm trying to reach who are probably a typical conservative male is not going to read it there. But what if I change the story a little bit and I make it more about the technology of energy, then it gets picked up on TechCrunch and that target audience member reads it. So it's that, ty that type of stuff you have to, if you are trying to get a message out, is to be able to know that environment and adapt to it. And I just want to uh, piggyback on that because I think it's a very, just a fascinating um, um, trend and it's also probably a missed opportunity for us to, to appreciate in our media space. I think the job of a communicator, let's say, as an earned media individual is, um, is complicated, but maybe a little bit easier. Because of this pressure of all we have these media outlets, um, what we don't have is a check and balance of how the narrative is established, how the policy frameworks are established. And in terms of research ideas, I, I, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is kind of what are those policy frameworks, how they create, how the language of the debate is structured. So you take in the energy space something constructed like clean coal. So clean coal is a phrase that was perpetuated and, and, has, and has been prop propagated by both paid media as well as earned media as a form of renewable technology. I'm not going to get into the debate about whether or not it's real or not, but the idea is that it's, it's a framework and in which um, a certain side wanted to have a context of that conversation. There has been a lot to examine of how that, what is the anatomy of those phrases? What is the anatomy of that conversation? Um, how did it even come to be? Um, there are groups and, and, and there's a framework that CAP wants to have with the conversations. There's a framework that the Heritage Foundation wants to have. And then if you actually try to follow those stories through of when those stories are placed, whether it's, you know, Podesta getting quoted or whether it's Gingrich getting quoted somewhere else, it's a fascinating ecosystem that you see of, of how these, um, these, the language of the debate is, is being constructed. We're not doing a great job in the media world of kind of being transparent about how those conversations are started in terms of how our sources are, 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 are gathered, you know, the pressure that our reporters and Charlie's reporters have faced over the years in terms of getting the deadline, getting the deadline. And, and sometimes it comes from a PR person who's coming from a side, and, and that, but that story has legs in a, insofar as that news cycle has legs, right? And so kind of examining over a news cycle um, these frameworks and how these frameworks are constructed, I think is a fascinating, necessary um, uh, evolution for our media companies to sort of kind of track. You have a question? So I work for a wire service. And as you discussed, uh, everybody's starting to report more and more like a wire service, right? You're going to put a hit. At 10 a.m., you're going to put a hit a little later, then your story's going to appear in the paper or something like that. So as everyone tries to become a wire service, what happens to the traditional wire service model? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the traditional wire services have been really grappling with that for the last few years. Um, what, is their, what is their unique value proposition with everybody else 
piling in here. Um, the the AP starts out with some tremendous institutional advantages. They're reached. They're everywhere, um, and. That's, that's an advantage and it's also a problem for them because that's a, an enormous amount of infrastructure that they have to carry. But what they can say to the market is, if it happens here, we're going to be here. The New York Times won't be here and the Wall Street Journal won't be here, but we will be. There is an urgent sure. need. Oops, sorry. There, there's an urgent need to have that service, to have somebody doing that. And, and you know, there is an opening for more citizen generated journalism to play a role in that but I, I think that you know you want you want reporters in all of these places um, I uh, you guys could talk about how to monetize that but I mean I hope it doesn't go away I'll address that a little bit because um, uh, I'm a former wire service reporter as well and and the AP is actually a client um, and, and I can tell you that um, there is you know an extraordinary amount of thinking internally um, not just about the business model of the future, but literally about about what the product is. Um, and uh, there have been some pretty interesting uh, um, transformations underway among wire services, um, re rethinking their storytelling, um, thinking about the you know the assets, the the, the strengths that they have, um, and how those can be maintained as strengths rather than as crippling weaknesses. Uh, because all that infrastructure um, is is extraordinarily expensive, um, but but it provides things like uh, like global access to just about anyone. So 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 what do you what do you do with that infrastructure that's um, somehow better than and different than the generic um, wire service uh, reporting, which which has really been devalued in the uh, in the, in the digital market. Um, um, insider perspectives uh, on the news, first-person eyewitness reporting uh, by skilled reporters as opposed to unskilled um, uh, citizen reporters, direct contact with, um, with the world, a conversation around news rather than um, uh, straight reporting of news. There are, there are all sorts of ways that um, that that wire services with deep resources can rethink how they do things, uh, and I think they're they're really only at the beginning of that. And on top of that, everything else we talked about, uh, data uh, and, uh, and and extracting data from content, um, uh, syndicating data in different ways, because wire services are also the original aggregators. Aggregation uh, is a powerful business model today, um, as as Huffington Post might. Uh, might acknowledge, um, and and um, aggregation can can itself be reformatted and, and reimagined. So um, I think there's a lot of a lot of work there, but but a lot of creative opportunity, both on the storytelling and the business side. I think uh, what I, I will say on this is uh, the trend that I I, um, I think is going to happen. Why sort of specialization? So what's going to have to happen when you see these behemoths, AP is going to be fine, AP is going to be is successful, and it can continue to be successful for other wire services, or the business model of a wire service is that it's got to show, I think, a, a core competency in a specialized area. So you might start seeing in nonprofit journalism, for example, and you'll see this with Center for Public Integrity, for example, where they've amassed just a talent of, of reporters who um, unfortunately were um, uh, stranded by companies like National Journal, um, but they're, they're, uh, their special is, specialty is in lobbying and again following the money so that they can act as if, um, and Publica has this model too, where they can sort of kind of create a, uh, a syndication model for a bunch of different media outlets um, that becomes a revenue stream. So specializing in that way, there's a company that started by a friend of mine named Scott Carp called Publish2 which is trying to um, be disruptive to the AP model by going local to the local, the remaining local newspapers are out there and, and try to syndicate that type of content on a larger scale to other media outlets um, in a way that kind of reverse content farming to a certain extent. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity, but it's not whether it's a wire service or not a wire service, I think it's trying to be um, creative and imaginative about uh, distribution. 
Yeah, but don't don't write off the wires too quickly. I mean, after all, they are a model where one person writes and many people subscribe. So that's still a lot cheaper model than when a newspaper tries to hire a reporter to do it, do all that stuff, him or herself. I think this is the last question. No, no. So uh, you guys kind of had me thinking about infotainment and the younger generation and, and things like that. And I was wondering, John Stewart, the Colbert Report, so many people get their information, especially the younger generation. And I was looking up at your model, and I thought, this is not even being addressed. And this is definitely a business model that I think is happening right now. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, since we haven't even kind of touched any, any mention of that. So uh, I think that's a, a, a very interesting question. So you know, we have been uh, partners with uh, John Stewart and Colbert through the, the, the Insanity Rally. Um, the line between uh, entertainment politics is a, a blurry one, as we were talking about through Fox. In terms of it being a sustainable business model, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a sustainable business model. There is, um, obviously, um, uh, it's a source parody and, and comedy is, is a source of information for some folks. Uh, it's not necessarily one that can be monetized through an advertising model or through uh, circulation. Um, but it's a world that obviously HuffPost is a part of too. I mean, our, our both our entertainment and politics, uh, the, the overlap between that audience is, is very, very interesting. Um, and, and so for a monetization opportunity, it really has to come out to the audience and who we have that's reading information. Not necessarily the blurring of that information in terms of its output, but in terms of how people consume the information is where we're going to see, I think, the monetization. I think that they have, uh, that Colbert and, and John Stewart are doing something that um, we are seeing successful publications do, um, and, and I'll throw Politico out here again, that, that one thing Politico does very well is it lends voice to its story. And it decides what a story is, and it, it puts it in its own unique voice. The Economist does this, which is we, we talked about before, Actually, but, HuffPost does that too. and HuffPost does that as well, thank you. Um, now their voice, their voice is, it's satire. But it is information, and it is news, and it's a take on the news, and it's delivered in a very clear way and in an easily branded way because it's so recognizable. And I, I think that it does fit in with the piece of, of you know, the, the news delivery method that's really most effective right now. I, th I think it comes down to also what, what I've been really appreciative of uh, being a part of Huffington Post is that the idea of not having perspective is is false, and that having a perspective is is extremely important, and we have to lead let our readers make a decision about um, the decisions they make. But uh, we are never going to abandon the idea of having uh, a voice and attitude about the world, the way that we package or present stories. It's it's part of our, our our mission and what we think is necessary in the marketplace. And I think that voice and attitude is one that's led to our success and it's going to continue to our lead our success. Um, you don't you don't you should not check your your viewpoints at the door when you're producing content. And I think what we're seeing is successful uh, business models out there are the ones that that understand that. Okay. Um I would really like to thank all our panelists and the audience members. Um, uh, I think we really had a very, very useful and fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody.